Thank you. Thank you very much. It is such a, a pleasure and an honor to be here and have a chance to talk to you uh, because I, just, I remember very clearly the moment when I read Devil in a Blue Dress for the first time. And for me, it has a lot of resonance because I think I probably recently moved to Los Angeles, for example. I wanted to be a writer, but I was just a professor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I loved detective stories, and I loved African-American literature. And so all these things were being brought together for me all at once in Devil in a Blue Dress. And of course, your career has gone on from there to to a, a huge number of books. Now, this is the funny thing. <laughs> you know, I wanted to find out how many books has Walter Mosley published. So I, I looked at various interviews that you've done, and they introduced the interviews. And from a few years ago, it was like, well, he's, he's done 45 books. Okay. And then a couple of years later, he's got 48 books. And then I just gave up. I, said, I was going to say over 50 books. Yeah. And now I, I asked Walter before we got on stage, how many books have you actually published? He says, 53 to 57. OK, so this is the scale. This is the pace at which we're talking about. And, and I'm, I only have, I'm working on my fifth book right now. So my, my first question is, how do you write so many books? Well, I, I, all I do is write. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I was thinking about that this morning. I think, well, all I really do is write. So I mean, I should should be a lot of books, right? If like no, no matter no what you do, if you only do that one thing, you should do a whole lot of it. How many cars have you fixed? If you're a car mechanic, you know probably thousands. Um, I I write every, every day, you know, as, about maybe 360 days a year, uh, three hours every morning. And you know, the more you write, the more you write. Mm -hmm. It just, there, it just, it's just, it just starts to build. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I started off, I was one book a year. Then it was two. Now it's about three. Mm -hmm. It could be more, but you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I want to keep it because my publishers get mad. I, I have so many, I have so many questions about this because you make it sound easy. Three hours a day, three hundred and sixty days a year. Uh -huh. uh, I, 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 from what I understand, you don't do Twitter, for example. You don't do social media. No. So that no. gives you an extra three, four hours a day right off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. No, absolutely. <laughs> so do you write? Uh, one book at a time, and then stop, and then you start another one. Or are you doing multiple multiple projects? Well, I, it, for all intents and purposes, it's one book at a time. So I'm w writing a book, let's say. So I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing, and I do it and I do it and I do it, and then I say, oh, it's finished now, more or less. So I'll send it to my my editor. All right, that's on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So on Wednesday, I send it to my editor. On Thursday, you know, it hadn't even gotten there yet, and the editor's going to take forever. So on Thursday, I start a new book. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I'm, I write every day, so like I'm, now I'm writing this new book, and that goes on for let's say like four weeks, five weeks, and then the book I wrote comes back, you know, with editing things. So I said, okay, then I put the put away number two, and I start working on number one again. I finish probably that. This probably doesn't take that long, maybe a month, maybe a little bit more. Then I send that in, and I go back to two, you know, and, and they're really working on it now. And so then I get to the end of two, and I send that, you know, probably to another publisher. And then, so then I start on number three, you know, and so it's juggling, but it's juggling over a period of time. Yeah. Now I think that's really important to know because I think I think for a lot of writers, they finish <clears throat> their book or their essay or their story, and then they're like, now what? Now I'm going to go out and celebrate, and then you they wait for whatever reaction or lack of reaction is going to happen. And I think for a working writer, I, I, it's exactly right. It's just a job. You get up and you you do yeah. it every every day. Um, yeah. But you also, besides writing fiction, you're also writing. Screenplays and, and teleplays as well, right? Yeah. Okay. So how how do you do how do you juggle these these two things? Well, the they, same way. Yeah. I mean, you know, I might like for instance on that Thursday, I might start a screenplay if I'm if I'm supposed to be writing something, I'm, I might do that. I mean, as when I work in television, that's different. I'll do that work at another time of day. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm you know, writing a, a show for TV, you sit there in those writers' rooms and just go, oh my god. Eight hours a day. What am right. I doing? Right. I started working in writers' rooms when I was 65. When I should have been retiring, I had my first full-time job in like 30 years. Right. So ridiculous. Right. So that's weird, right? Because I mean, most of what you're describing, you're sitting in a room by yourself or wherever wherever it is that you write. Mm -hmm. Now you have to be in this room with another group of people, and yeah. you're trading ideas back and forth. Do you find that to be enhancing your creativity, or is that is that an obstacle to collaborate with with other I, people? I really, I, I have no idea. I don't like it. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, if you're having sex and you're not enjoying having sex, it doesn't matter what it does. I mean, you, know, you don't like it, you know, but, but you do it because they're paying you. And, right. you know, and, there, and, there's some, and there's, there's some, you know, like commitment there. You know, I don't want it to sound like prostitution, but, you know, um, you know, so, I, you know, you, you, 
you, I do it. And, and it works, you know? And when I, I get to go off on my own, because you peel off every once in a while and say, yeah. OK, now, Walter, you ready to write that script? I said, man, I've been ready for weeks. Let me go. And, and then you go write it, and then you come back. And, you know, yeah. and some, you know, there's a certain kind of satisfaction. Right. And it's like a community, you know? I mean, I'm, not a, I'm from Los Angeles. You know, most people in Los Angeles aren't very social. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Who lives next door to you? I don't know, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It was well, this old lady, but now it might be this young guy. I don't know. So um, one of my jokes about Los <coughs> Angeles is that I'm a writer in Los Angeles, yeah. which means nobody cares. Yeah, right. Yeah. Nobody cares. But that's because I'm a fiction writer, right? But if you're a screenwriter or a TV writer, is there a little more prestige on top of that? Because at least people will say, oh, OK, you're, working, you're writing for TV, you're writing for the movies. Well, well not in Hollywood. In yeah. Hollywood, if you're a writer, it's like, it's like oh. You know, so you're not making any money, right? Because, you, know, <laughs> you know, the people who make the most money are the producers. Right. They make the most money. And then, you know, and the writers, they, make, they think they're making a lot of money because they used to work at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. but, but they're really not right. if they compare themselves to, right. like, you know, the people who are really, you know, making yeah. money. Well, you should talk to some poets, you know, because that would make you feel really rich I if know. you see what poets are getting paid. Po poets they... are interesting, yeah. yeah. Poets are interesting. I mean, you know, one of the, I mean, you know, one of the things I you know, talk about in the book is just that, you know, I mean, if you don't know how to write poetry, you don't know how to write. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might not write good poetry, but mm -hmm. you need to know how to write it, because if you don't know it, so like, you know, so, I, you know, I have nothing but reverence for poets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I write fiction, I also make it a point to read poetry as well, because for most poets, they're not as invested in the questions of narrative that fiction writers right. are invested in. They're invested in images and rhythms and so on, which you're absolutely right. It's crucial yeah. to how you write a sentence, the how you music, punch up the language yeah. and the music. Word repetition, yeah. all that stuff, yeah. yeah. OK, so you wrote a book, Elements of Fiction. And it's actually your second nonfiction book about writing. Your first one, which and I read both. Your first one was, this year you write your novel. And I read it, and I did not write my novel in a year. So it did not quite work. But okay. I still gleaned a lot of wisdom from it. And Elements of Fiction is a book about fiction writing, obviously. But as, as I read it, I couldn't help but think that it was also a book about life and about mm. living as well. And I'll try to you know, point out where I think I see these overlaps. And maybe I'm completely wrong. Well, I want to know. Me. Yeah, okay. Well, OK, here's the first one. So we've talked a lot about your success. I now want to talk about failure. Yeah. OK, because as a writer, I'm not that interested in the success of other writers. That just makes me feel bad. Yeah. That's what I think about you, but that, yeah, that's okay. all right. Uh, so there is actually a passage in your book where you talk about failure, and you say, failure is an essential raw material from which our stories arise. Yeah. So you're successful, obviously, but how important has failure been to your life and work? Well, I think that when, whenever you're, you're working on, in, in any kind of art or science, Failure is the thing. Every time you, 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 you fail, you get closer to, to the right move. Mm -hmm. every, time you, every time that you fail, you're, you, you're, you, you learn something. You, know, it might, you might learn something more from failing than maybe succeeding you know, in an experiment or you know, trying to describe a, a situation or a person or a mm -hmm. place. You know. So before you published Devil in a Blue Dress, how much failure did you encounter as a writer? How old were you when you published it, and how much failure did you encounter before Devil in a Blue Dress? Well, you know, I had been. You know, really, like, you can call it failure, but it's like so much fun. I was, I was studying writing at City College in New York. I was in my 30s, 35, 36. I had just started. I mean, I would never wanted to be a writer before I just started. And my teacher in fiction is, in my opinion, the greatest living writer in the English language, Edna O'Brien. And, you know, Edna was, you know, she's so great. She had the great Irish brogue. And, you know, and she's so crazy, really, and so unbelievably beautiful. There was all these things about her. And one day she said, Walter, write a novel. <laughs> like, just like that. And I went, OK. And I went home and I wrote a novel. I was uh, six weeks. I was just writing, writing. I just said, Edna said, do this. I'm writing it. I'm, I'm going to do it, you know. And I did it, you know. And um, I sent it out. And it was, it was, uh, it was you know, Gone Fishing. I finally published it with Paul Coates at Black Classic Press. But um, I, I um, I'd sent it out, and people kept sending it back, saying, it's really wonderful writing, but it's not commercial. Really wonderful writing. And, and I finally understood not commercial meant it was about two young black men, Easy Rollins and, and Mouse, a, a coming of age uh, you know, in, in the back, backwoods of, you know, of, of East Texas. And, um, they, and people said, well, it's about these two young black men, but there's, you know, there's, there's no white people except one crazy white lady. And, and there's very few black women. I mean, they're there, but they're not central characters. And they said, you know, 
uh, white people don't read about black people, and black women don't like black men, and black <laughs> men don't read. So who gonna read your book? Yeah. Now, they were wrong. Mm -hmm. They were wrong, mm -hmm. but, but they were right because they were the publishers. Mm -hmm. And if, they, if, if, they're right, if they're not gonna publish your book, then they're right. Yes, right. Right. Then these books don't get published. So, so that was a complete failure. But you know, I, you know, I knew about Bernard Malamud. Every book he wrote was a failure until he wrote The Natural. And he, that only got published because it was about baseball. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I'll go write another book. You know, I mean, you know, Edna told me to write. And so then I wrote Devil in a Blue Dress like that. I mean, everybody wanted it, except one guy, yeah. one guy. So. Yeah. There's already in black. They okay, I mean, basically, it sounds like you didn't have to deal with that much failure, basically, from my perspective, <laughs> before, before Devil. No I, I spent 20 years writing a short story collection, for example. Yeah. You know, that was, that was sucked. No, um, wait, wait, wait they, like, but were people telling you not to write these stories, or did you just take 20 years? I, I took 20 years, and I published them here and there, you know, but uh -huh. they, not even my mother cared, you know, so it, it's... Uh, That's really true, right? Yeah, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody yeah. cares when you're a writer. No, yeah. I mean, and then you publish your book, and then the first question people ask you is, like, when's it going to be a movie? When's it yeah. going to be a TV series? It's a deeply irritating question. You know, don't ask that question. But so, you get that more in L.A. than other yeah. places, but yeah. 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 Right. Um, Okay, so rejection, uh, uh, rejection. Now, you are a famous writer, and people who are not famous writers who want to be writers probably look at you and say, wow, Walter Mosley gets to do whatever he wants. He writes best-selling novels and so on and so forth. But in fact, you still have to deal with grief from <laughs> your publishers, right? Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, publishers are like, they're, 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 I mean, they're, they're so willing to discard you. There's so much looking for the new, right? Well, at the new, there's a chance that the new will hit, you know. And they said, well, you, you know, like people said, well, isn't Walter Mosley dead, you know? <laughs> and, I, and you know, I, I sold a, I sold a, uh, I sold a book. I wrote, you know, this book that I won all these awards for, you know, down the river onto the sea. It's a mystery. And uh, I went to this publisher, and they said, well, we'll only publish it if you give us the easy, uh, an Easy Rollins book. And I said, well, I can't do that because I have one, but it's, it's going to another publisher. And I said, well, then we can't publish it. And it was just, I mean, really, honestly, I had to go to that person's boss and say, come on now. But that's, you know, I mean, that's business, right? And, and yeah. it's deeply irritating. So, I mean, my story is I, I've got, I got an agent, you know, after my short story collection, and I, I went to, to meet him in New York, and very nice guy. But the first words in his, out of his mouth in person to me were, are you ready to make some money? And that was actually the last yeah. thing in my mind, wow. right? I just wanted to get published. I wanted to be an artist. But you know, publishing is a commercial thing. There's money involved, and so of course, my thing is, you know, your, your, your books are still going to sell. They're not. Maybe they won't be a bestseller if it's not Easy Rollins, but yeah. they're still going to sell. So it's sort of ridiculous that these publishers are so short-sighted. Yeah, well, this. it's the, the idea is like you know that you know, and and really honestly, you know, I, I would I ha would have so much you know trouble with people. This this book that I published with our you know publisher in common, John Woman. I I had spent 20 years writing John Woman. I just couldn't finish it, and I finally finished it, and I went. Uh, you know, to all these people, and really, I got I think nineteen rejections, mm -hmm. and I and I I told them I, like I didn't I don't want a lot of money. I just want you to publish a book. I got nineteen rejections. One people one woman wrote me a, a note, and she said, um, uh, uh, "Walter, um, uh, if you want to have a meeting with me, and I, I can explain to you how you write a novel." I really, I, I, I've written more novels than she's published, but 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 she's like, I, and I, you know, just all, you know, it was it was really ridiculous. Even though I wasn't at, because a lot of times people will say, well, I expect a lot of money. If you're making a lot of money, you expect a lot of money. You say, like, I can't, you know, write a book, you know, for only this because I'm going to pay my rent. I understand that, but you know, I don't think like that. I like writing. I like publishing books. I like discussing things. I might write a political monograph. You know, I might write anything. You know, and, and but I, I, there's there's an expectation in their head. Well, if I'm going to have you, I'm going to have to have this much money. So if you want to come to me, come to me. And I've had a lot of, a lot of publishers. Right. I was just at a black conference, and they were saying, oh, you know, there's all these wonderful black editors, uh, and they they publish you because these white people, you know. And I'm like, well, listen, I've been to all those black editors with my John Woman book, and they all said no. But the white guy Morgan Indrigan said he published it. Yeah. So, like, I mean. Let's, let's, let, you know, we can break things down to race a lot, but not, not everything. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel better. 19 rejections. 19. I only got 13 for my novel, Nin so it's 19? good. Okay. That's, that's what. Really, I was <laughs> amazed. I was just astonished, right. you know? And they were like, write, wrote long letters. My agent said, you want to read the letter? And I said, well, did they accept the book? And she goes, uh, no. And I said, well, no, I don't want to read their letter. <laughs> I don't care what they say. 
you know? I actually said something else, but I won't say it here. <laughs> well, I think that's, that's actually one of the things you don't talk about in elements of fiction in terms of what's needed to be a writer, which is have a really thick skin. Mm -hmm. Because for the most part, for most of us, you know, unless we're super lucky or super you know, geniuses, we get more rejections than we do acceptances, especially at the, at the beginning. And uh, unless you are able to overcome those rejections and write because you, I assume because you want to write, you're never going to get uh, to become that, the writer that you envision yourself to be. So you have become that writer, and I think you have a very strong voice as a writer, and that is one of the topics of elements of fiction. So in yeah. elements of fiction, you know, Walter spells out or leads us through various elements such as character, plot, dialogue, and so on. But to me, it seemed like voice was one of the most important yeah. parts of this. So f maybe not everybody has heard about this idea. It's very common among writers, but maybe you can tell us, what do you mean by voice? Well, you know, I mean, there, there are different things. I mean, there, there, one, there's like a narrative voice, right? So it could be the first person narrative or the third person narrative or the universal God narrative. Um, but there's, a, there's also, the novel has a sound, a vibration, a music. It has a, it has a way of moving forward that becomes very familiar, almost like a person, but it's not a person. It's, 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 it's an experience that you're having with reading the fiction. The, the fiction has to you know, kind of co cohese into a, like a place. It's almost like if you were you know, looking at, at, at a certain kind of countryside, an English countryside, it's not going to look like the Redwoods. It's going to look like, like a certain thing. It's going to be itself. And this novel becomes itself through language, through vibrations, through music, through the way that things are, 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 are said. And even the way things that are said that are not like the rest of the thing, like all of a sudden somebody says something and they sound completely different. Well, that's good because it helps to balance what you're doing in the work. Yeah, I mean, you say, for example, that the, the voice is the chant and the lingo that become the unconscious chorus yeah. of the novel. Yeah. And that's, you know, this is crucial for the reader because you say that the reader has empathy with this linguistic personality. Right, they develop a relationship. Right, with I mean, yeah. so part of me, we read books for different reasons, right? When we're compelled by the plot or whatever, but oftentimes we read books because we fall in love with the voice of the book, yeah. the voice of the narrator, the voice of the characters, but I say, you know, we, the, with the voice of the author too, or, or, or is that different? Is that, is, is that the persona of the author, or, or do authors also have voices? God, that's such a hard thing to, I mean, really, I think that might be true sometimes and not others, that, that the, um, I mean, especially true in, in nonfiction, where the, the, the author's voice is, is more present you know, because it's more an, an either an opinion or a point of view or a, a kind of ob objectivity. But in, in novels, it's interesting. I mean, because really, there's there's music to, to novels that are you know that are that a lot of people might not like. I mean, like Mickey Spillane. You know, I mean, you know, you you, you read him two pages of Mickey Spillane, you know that's one of his novels, mm -hmm. and you know the voice, you know the world, you know the music. You know, you might hate it, but you still know it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, James Elroy, too, I imagine, yeah, if you're absolutely. talking about this universe of, yeah. of crime writers. Um, so, you know, voice, I think, is really interesting because uh, for a lot of writers, uh, we, we struggle to come up with our voice. This is a common idea. I don't know if this is true mm -hmm. for you, but, you know, you, you, you spend years and years, you know, working on your craft, on your art, and so on and so forth. But part of what you're doing, besides technique, searching for technique, is trying to find out what you want to say. That's what I mean by, by the writers. And how you want to say voice. it, and, yeah. and that changes. Right. Yeah. But it's a very kind of mystical thing. It's a very intuitive thing. You can't actually teach someone that, can you? How to find you can't their teach voice? it, but you can learn it. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. One of the ways that I that I, I was approaching, which I talk about in this year, you write, uh, is um, at some point I just stop and read a whole novel into a tape recorder, mm -hmm. and you really hear the voice of that novel when you're reading it out loud, mm -hmm. and when you're listening to it, you go, oh, "Wow, no, that." That sentence, and you know, it'd be like this, that sentence doesn't work. It does work, mm -hmm. but it doesn't fit mm -hmm. like everything else fits around it. It, it feels, you know, like, you know, some, something that's, a, you know, like another creature that's snuck into the flock. You got to get rid of that thing. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of wonderful. I think that, and, and, and things like that help you, help you get it. Uh, uh, doing readings, when you go, you go to events and you'll, you'll, you'll read from your book, you begin to learn more about it, you know? Yeah, and so this is where I think one way in which elements of fiction is not just about fiction writing, but about larger issues, because it seems to me, hmm. you know, we as individual writers struggle to find our voice, but is it too far-fetched to say that 
we as individuals as a whole are also trying to find our voices as well. Uh, you know, what we have to say to the world, how we, how we see ourselves, how we comport ourselves with, with other people. Yeah, no, I think, or if not, if, that, if people aren't looking for it, they should be looking for it. Yeah. I believe everybody should write a novel. Yeah. I mean, whether the novel's published or not, once, when, once you organize yourself on that kind of level. I'm not sure I agree with you, actually. I'm not sure I, everybody should write a novel. I, I Why not? don't know. Why, well, if you don't show it to anybody, it's fine. Well, no, right. I, I, you know, they don't have to get it published. <laughs> they want, you know, a lot of people won't get them published, but you would, you would I think the, the idea, or even just a story, like that was the whole thing, that reason I started writing. I just wanted to write a story. Beginning, middle, end. I just wanted that. If I could do that, mm -hmm. then I'd be okay. Yeah. And uh, and I think that if you do it and you, and and you say something like you you write something about some aunt or some experience or some or something that you wish had happened, mm -hmm. uh, and I think I think it's 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 good because it 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 create it, it it works on your own creativity. Yeah. And 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 make and makes you have a relationship to that creativity. Right. Yeah. And the, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm even bringing this out is because, you know, someone, someone like you, you know, you're a public figure. So people are reading your books because they enjoy them, but, you know, they also come here and listen to you or because they, they, they hear a voice, right? I just listened to an interview. I, I pay them, too. Oh, you, I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. $10 each at the end of the thing. I mean, you see when they That's get the book, obviously. That's a proposition. I wonder why you're writing for TV. Oh, yeah. Uh, Anyway, yeah. but I, 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 on the way out here, I listened to a conversation you did with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar mm. at the New York Public Library. You can find this online very, uh, very easily. I think it's from 2016. But it was a great conversation, and not just because of the books that you were talking about, uh, but because you both have strong voices, I think. Yeah. You both have something to say. Now, that's, that's, that's crucial. And of course, writers should have something to say, but so should each of us. Uh, and, but it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of courage to be able to find out what that voice is and and to be able to speak that out loud. So it's very hard to teach that. It's, it's one of the elements of fiction that I think are, that are very mystical, very intuitive. And another thing that you talk about is this idea that the novel is both something intellectual, it comes out of your mind, but also something emotional and intuitive that mm. comes from the heart. This is the, these are the two images that you use. And you use this idea of the child mind, is that right? Yeah. That writers have to tap in. What is this child mind that writers have to, to tap into? Well, I, I think people, you know, adults, uh, you know, and this starts from adolescence on, are very self-critical. They're very worried. Oh, what does this look like? What does this sound like? What does this make me, you know, how, how am I, how do I appear to other people? Am I good? Am I bad? Is it wrong? Is it, is it, and, and also then people get really, you know, is it perfect? And children just want to play. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you, you tell a child a story and, the, and, 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 the, and they're excited and they want to hear that story again and again and again. And then the next thing you know, they're telling their own story. And you know, it has little pieces of what they've heard, but it has new things because they're, they're adding it and changing it. And, you know, and that's, that, that's the child mind, mm -hmm. you know, just to say, well, let's just, you know, just start playing, you know, just start writing, just start thinking. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad, if it's right, right or wrong. You know, I mean, kids right. are never thinking that. Right. You know, they're saying, well, it was like this, and now it's like this, and now it's like that. Right. You know? Yeah, and I have a six-year-old boy, mm -hmm. so I get a daily reminder of the child's mind yeah. all the time. That's good. And in fact, he and I are publishing a book together in November. Oh, it's that's his great. story. You know, that's he came great. up with this yeah. crazy story about chickens who become pirates. I never could have, <laughs> never could have imagined that. Um, so coming out from McSweeney's in November. Um, oh, but that's if you don't yeah. have a six-year-old to remind you, how do you tap into this? Well, After you know, decades and decades of adulthood. Most, most of us have it, and most of us know we have it. We just try to hide it. Mm -hmm. We try to not be that person. We try to be that adult person. But, you know, you, if you just, the, the way in, in writing, you know, the way I was talking about the blank page when I'm talking about the child mind, one of the things is, well, just start writing. Like you said, well, well what am I going to write? I said, I don't know. And you don't either, but just start writing. Mm. And you're right, you know. I, I have in here, you know, there's a tiny head at the, the, at the top of the water, but really underneath there's a giant turtle. And, you know, and you've written, you know, this thing, and maybe it's good, you know, maybe it's not good, maybe you throw it away, then you write something else. The, the thing is, is just, just, just start doing. Because that's, you know, it, kids aren't silly, or they're not, you know, they're not laughing, they're not this and that. They're very serious, you know. So, well, okay, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write a story. My mother is very beautiful, except when she's mad at me, you know? And it's like, hey, that's, that's good, you know? It's like, yeah. But, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, that's the great thing. I, I really, I was watching this comedian last night. He died a long time ago, but I was, I was watching him. And he just kept talking about how ugly his wife was. It was just so funny. He said, my wife is so ugly, you know? And it was just, he just went on and on and on. And I was like, wow, you know? But, that, I mean, it was incredibly funny. He discovered something, you know, in himself, you know, 
uh, you know, I'm sure his wife is very beautiful, but uh, he, 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 he just, like, you know, you just start, you just start doing it. And the thing is to let go, right. to, start, to start work. But I'm, I'm sure you know that, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> no. And, you know, part of the process of writing for me is to keep uh, drilling. So the writer Haruki Murakami also has a great book on writing called What We Talk About When We Talk About Running. And this, this guy is crazy. He, he runs marathons. He runs six miles every day, runs marathons. He runs these ultra marathons that are not 26 miles, but 62 miles. And you know, he's like you. He, just, he produces a constant stream of books. And his metaphor is you've got to just drill into yeah. the rock until you hit water, but you never know when you're going to get there, yeah. right? So, and that's what the daily discipline of getting up and doing three hours every day yeah. does for you. Because I, I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of it is actually drudgery. And then you wait until you actually hit the water or whatever metaphor. You I like when use. you say drudgery. What do you mean? Like, uh, so here you one of the things that you say a couple of times, and it's true. You say writing is rewriting. Yeah. Okay. So for a lot of people, when they confront the blank page, uh, it's hard to put these first words down because you can't get rid of the self consciousness, and you think that that's crap. Mm -hmm. What I just wrote. You know, and that's kind of drudgery because if you if you're going to sit there for three hours and you write 500 words, whatever your your allotment is, you if if you don't have any inspiration that day, you trudge. You just want to put those words down mm -hmm. until you get to the rewriting part. For me, that's the fun part, the rewriting part. Then I can start to play with the language and everything. But I had to lay those words down in the first mm -hmm. place, and that that sometimes that's inspirational, sometimes, but most of the time it's work. But that's only why I've, I've only written five books, and he's written 57. <laughs> um, uh, so, the half of them weren't very good, though. Yeah. So it's but yeah, I but if half of them aren't very good. You still got twenty six or twenty seven yeah. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you um, like his jacket? It's like so good, right? Thank it's like beautiful. Yeah. It has a beautiful yeah. jacket. Uh, I do have fedoras. I thought about bringing them or one, but I thought no, this is your thing, your night. I'm not gonna. I, I would lose anyway if I wore a fedora. Uh, so uh, one of the things about elements of fiction is that it is it is an encouraging book, I think, yeah. you know, it's inspirational. And I, I, I listened briefly to the audible version of Elements of Fiction, narrated mm -hmm. by Mirren Willis, I think that's his name. He has a great voice. So one of the things, if you're a, an aspiring writer or a writer, you can just listen to this book at night yeah. and let it ease yeah. you into sleep and try to absorb some of the words. Um, <laughs> The child mind, tap into your child mind. So I have a question, uh, uh, it's not a skeptical question, but it's, it's a question about the child mind that, 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 that's, that's taking it from a reverse direction. Yeah. You know, you're encouraging us to tap into the child's mind, to go into our intuition, to find the inner child and so on, which is great. But what if your inner child is like a bully? <laughs> a, not a nice person. What if, what if your spirit is small rather than expansive? Uh, when you read fiction, for example, can you tell whether the, the writer's inner child or spirit is actually not that great not, from their no, fiction? It, it's, it's OK to be a bully. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, honestly, it's OK to be a bad person. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of bad people who are writers. Mm -hmm. I, I actually don't hang out with that many writers, because a lot of them I don't like. You know, <laughs> I don't like what they think. I don't like what they say. I don't like the way they say it. But, but uh, I think that they, you, you, no matter who you are and where you come from, you can write an interesting book. You got to. You just have to figure out how to make it make it interesting. Whether you're a bully or like you know whether whether you know uh, people can walk all over you. You know that's that's fun. That's fun. I mean, uh, you know, Grand in uh, in in the plague. You know, he's he's the hero of that novel. But you know, he's you know he can't do anything right. He can't do anything right. But he's still the hero of this incredibly important book, um, an existentialist novel. I so I think that. Yeah, no, whoever you, whoever you are, you know, if you can just l say what you really feel, because a lot of people feel bad shit, you know? I mean, they feel like, hey, you know, I want to kill those people. I want, you know, you know, I really, honestly, I was thinking about John Singleton, you know, because, you know, I've, I've done so much work with John, and John died, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, sad. But John used to come to me and say, well, Walter, you, you know what black women are like, right? <laughs> and I said, no, John, I don't. And neither do you, because... Black women are all different, you know, and we, you know, and, and he said, yeah, 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 but you know what I mean, right? And I, and you know, and it was like, you know, you can come from any point of view and get to that place. I mean, this John is a great filmmaker, a great filmmaker, and 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 an innovative filmmaker, somebody who who makes films that other people didn't, you couldn't imagine making, you know. But he came from you know a very specific place, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had very specific ideas and notions of the world, but didn't matter mm -hmm. because. 
you know, he, he, he knew how to make that into something beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. To bring up another example from Elroy, who we already mentioned, I remember, mm. uh, yeah, I loved his L.A. quartet, yeah. right? And then I read a couple of his early novels before the quartet, and I thought, and I thought they were not very good. Mm -hmm. And the reason why was because they weren't as racist as the L.A. Quartet was, <laughs> you know. Because he really, he, I don't know if he is or isn't, whatever. But I, he tapped into <laughs> it for the books. I mean, he, he portrayed yeah. guys at their worst, oh, yeah, which yeah. is probably how they were, right? Yeah, so that's so, when you said bully. I was thinking of Elroy, but I thought I wouldn't say. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's true, you know, I mean, he, he's not really like a warm and cuddly person. No. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I, but he writes, you know, books that, um, that portray a world that you have to believe. Mm -hmm. You can say, yeah, I know that motherfucker right there. I know, I know him, shit, you know, yeah. and I don't, I don't, you know, yeah. you want to go to Elroy's Ridge? No, I don't need to go to that. I, I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I know where he's coming from, right, right. you know, um, whether, whether or not he is. I mean, I, that's yeah. another thing. You know. But, I, I, you know, you have to believe that as a writer, you look, you, you, writers do have to go into parts of themselves that a lot of people would rather not go into. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you, got, you have to say things, you have to recognize, e if you're going to write evil, you've got to recognize evil in yourself. You know, that becomes the thing. You know, it's like a bully, shoot, man, I, I'm a murderer. You know, I'm just like, right. you know, and uh, at least when I'm writing, right. you know. Right. And so that is the thing about the inner child. You know, the inner child has, or the ch children that we see, yeah. have no restraints upon themselves. They don't have yeah. an adult telling them, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, which is both good, but also, you know, restrains certain impulses that, that shouldn't be out there, but these impulses really exist. Right. So here's something you say in your, your first book about um, uh, writing. This year you write your novel. You say that writers will have to deal with characters with dark sides or heroes with dark aspects. You say, you will have to cross over the line of your self restraint and revel in the words and ideas that you would never express in your everyday life. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How did that manifest? Give me an example in your own fiction of how that, how that manifested itself. Oh my god, Mouse. Sure. Yeah. I, I write about Mouse. Mouse is like, yeah, yeah I mean, really. Like, I, 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 it was my, my favorite thing I've wrote about Mouse is he, he's talking to Easy. He said, man, you know, I was down in Texas. That man, he arrested me, put me in handcuffs, you know, and he, and he the problem is he, he grabbed me by my, 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 my shirt and he pulled me close. He said, nigga, I'm going to kill you. But he got me so close that I could bite into his throat. He said, <laughs> I, I bit that motherfucker. I, I bit his windpipe right out. <laughs> you know, like, really, even if I was in that situation, I probably <laughs> wouldn't do that, even if I could do that. But Mouse, man, and really, and like, you hear people laughing. I, I really enjoy <laughs> that. It's like, because, you know, Mouse is, you know, he's, uh, he's not evil, but he's a sociopath. Um, with, and, and, you know, and I just kind of adore it. I really, I'm, and we really do. But, you know, Easy also, Easy has like, so I, even in this new novel I'm writing about Easy, he said, well, you know, Mouse said, he said, what do you think I should think about this? He said, you should stop thinking and start killing, man. That dude is, and, and, Easy, and Easy would think to himself, he said, well, you know, I have killed people before. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of another way around this guy, you know. So, and this is a thing that we usually don't, you know, think in everyday life. Well, there's one interview where you said you couldn't actually write a whole story or novel about Mouse. No. Because you're saying he's sociopathic, he's predictable, right? You chose Easy Rollins because, for at least, or at least one reason was because you wanted to have a black male hero yeah. in your books. Um, and part of the innovation of of Devil in a Blue Dress and the entire Easy Rollins series is, is that it puts a black male hero at the center of the book in LA, you know, which the way that's been, that was, has been portrayed historically by Hollywood, for example, is that as if, almost as if African Americans didn't exist yeah. in LA and the literary world too. And instead we built it, but yeah. yeah. Hey. Right, so I mean, so the Easy Rollins series is really interesting to me because on the one hand, it, it does what so-called genre fiction is supposed to do, the detective story, the mystery story, it's got a good plot, you know, all that stuff that keeps us turning the pages. And yet it also does what so-called literary fiction is supposed mm -hmm. to do, which is make us think about social, political, moral issues, make us look inside ourselves and our society. So uh, this is one of the pleasures of reading uh, that series, but also one of the pleasures of, for me of reading detective stories and spy fiction mm -hmm. and thrillers in yeah. general. And I'm going to float an idea by you. You tell me if, I, if you agree or you don't agree, which is it seems to me that in, in these so-called genre fictions, 
writers are very likely to confront some of our most our deepest problems as a society, in addition to telling a good mm -hmm. story. Yeah. You know, whether it's racism or the Holocaust or what have you. Um, literary, so-called literary fiction in the United States, you know, from my perspective, doesn't, 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 seems to be more afraid of confronting some of these deep-seated political and social issues. Do you agree with that? Um, I think that, well, you know, I, here's what I think. I think that there's, you know, somebody says literary fiction. And, you know, and I always like, try to be clear. I said, well, literary doesn't mean good. Mm -hmm. It just means literary. There's a lot of bad literary books that don't you know, dare mm -hmm. uh, uh, to go far enough, don't take the risks, don't, don't really face something, don't, don't make a statement. Um, and it's more bald in, in, in literary fiction because they don't have the genre to hide behind. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that a, a lot of literary fiction is exactly as you say. It, it just, you know, it's just there. You know, there was a you know a young woman who you know has a friend who had a mother who had a, a boyfriend who also went out with the sister. I, you know, and you're like, okay, you know, and you know, and it's 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 emotional in that way, but it, it doesn't it doesn't get really down into you know because without uh, politics and society, you don't have people. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I, that's why I'm very careful to use so-called because I don't I don't believe in these distinctions. You yeah. know, like I don't care what so-called genre people are are writing in. There's a lot of bad so-called genre fiction. There's a lot, I, I, yeah. I don't I actually don't read most detective fiction, for example. I don't care. I yeah. can, if I if I read a, a series a detective series, one of the problems, you know, I'm reading. I like, I'm a fan of Joe Nesbo. I don't know if you if you read his work. He's, it, they're they're t totally thrilling page turners, and I cannot for the life of me remember which of his books I've read. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, I, know. I don't know where to I start again. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whereas I remember, I remember your stories because there's something else besides just the, the mystery plot that's taking right. place. So so-called. So literary fiction, I say so-called because I think literary fiction is in fact a genre too that people can hide behind. Right. It's like, oh, I'm writing literary fiction. It's smart. It's sophisticated, etc. And it doesn't have anything to say. So uh, your work, I think, obviously is very well respected in the worlds of, of crime fiction, mystery, mystery fiction, and so on. Um, how, how, how do you think your reception is in the so-called literary world? Well, you know, that, I, I, mean, I have a, a description of that. Um, you know, I live in New York, mostly. Um, but, you know, I, I don't have any writer friends in New York. None, actually, none. And, uh, and, I, and I, I find myself a little kind of ostracized. I said, well, you know, he write, you write mysteries. And I said, well, you know, more than half of my books aren't mysteries. And they go, yeah, yeah, but you know, you're a mystery writer. You know, and, and it you know, kind of puts me in my place, right? Um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Penn uh, uh, has never, never, <laughs> like, you know, nominated me for anything. Mm. But every year when they have their fundraiser, they have me host a table. Mm. Because everybody who wants to give money, like, and I said, well, we need you, Walter. I said, well, you didn't need me when you had the Penn Awards, <laughs> you know? Like, my books aren't good enough for your Penn Awards? Well, uh, <laughs> oh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and luckily, the, the, the community of writers don't define writing. They think they do, but they don't define writing. Mm -hmm. Writing is defined by readers, people who, like, you know, read books and, and respond to books by librarians, by children, by, you know, by people who are looking for themselves mm -hmm. in fiction. And if they find themselves there, they say, well, this is a good book because I found myself there, which is, you know, why it would be a good book, you know. And so, um, you know, so, I, you know, it, it kind of goes back and forth, you know. I mean, you know, literary writers also say, well, what do you complain about? You make money. I got, I got to work. And I said, well, okay. You know, but, you know, I still think I write good books, you know. <laughs> um, you know, but listen, what are you going to do? Well, I think you should rest assured, right? I mean, when we look at literary history, I mean, there are so-called genre writers who still remain in our minds from 100, 200 years ago, and most so-called literary writers have completely vanished. So oh, right. this is a, this, well, these categories don't mean anything. Well, almost all, all, all writing that lasts was popular writing in right. its time. I mean, Shakespeare was a popular writer. You were talking about, you know, like, you know, bad people. You couldn't have Iago have his own play, but he's by far the most outstanding character in Othello. I mean, I, I saw that play and I went, oh my God, and I felt so guilty because I like the white guy, you know? And I said, I should like the black guy. I don't give a fuck about him. This guy is like so great, he hates so well. I really, I would like to hate that well, you know? It's like, you know, I don't, you know, it was like, God, it's, he's so great, you know? 
So, you know. But have you ever put an anti-hero, a black male anti-hero in your books? I mean, as a central character, not as a, a supporting character. Well, you know, Socrates Fortlow kind of works in that way. You know, he's a, he's a tough guy. He's done some bad things. There's no excuse. Uh, when they let him out of prison, he thought, why you let me out of prison? I was, oh, because I kill black people. You know, because if I kill white people, I'd still be in prison, and I should be in prison. But he got out, and he, and he slowly kind of found himself, you know? But you have to understand, I think that Mouse and Jackson Blue and all these other people in these Rawls novels, they're also black male heroes. You know, they're people that, that you know, kind of make a place for themselves in the world, in a world where we've been completely, you know, bereft. Mm -hmm of black male heroes, mm -hmm. even from uh, uh, black male writers, uh, uh, Richard Wright, uh, James Baldwin, uh, Ralph Ellison. Mm -hmm. I mean, they write about black male protagonists, mm -hmm. but they're not heroes. So why do you think that's the case? I don't even know. I mean, I understand why white people don't write about them, you know? Uh, I mean, a couple of them do, and not very well, but they do. And, uh, but I, I think that there's, that I think that black men, black male writers, Made made a, a deep commitment, you know, uh, to you know, uplifting the race, which you know is not something you know. I mean, you want you uplifted, you're not uplifted. I really don't care, you know. I just want to write a book that's a lot of fun, mm -hmm. you know, in which you see yourself and identify you with yourself, and maybe there's some exhilaration in how you feel it. Uh, I think that you know, you know, Wright and Ellison and, and Baldwin, these are great writers, by the way. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denigrating them. Um, they were they're trying to do something else. And you know, and it's and when I came along, it was like kind of time for a change. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not everybody uh, likes to use the simple stories. Mm -hmm. Simple's a hero. Mm -hmm. And he's great, mm -hmm. you know, and it, you kind of love it. You know, you say, damn, I can I, I can hardly wait to read the new story. Mm -hmm. You know. <clears throat> so I mean, part of what you're saying is, you know, uh, just I'm just gonna pick on Easy Rollins, you know. The, the presence of Easy Rollins in these novels are on the one hand making an intervention into the, the, the whole literary landscape, New York publishing, all this kind of stuff. They had never <coughs> seen a black male hero before, or at least for a very long time. But it's also you're, you're, you're positioning yourself against sort of the dominant version of African American literature, at least African American literature written by black male writers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, do, you, do you see yourself as a part of African American literary tradition, or is the fact that you are a so called genre writer also put you? in an ambivalent place in relationship to that uh, genealogy as well. Well, you know, I, I, mean, this is a, I mean, that's a, a hard question to answer. You know, um, you know, I, you know I, I don't come, you know, from those places, you know, where, you know, uh, Richard Wright and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker come from. You know, I, I, don't, I don't come from those places of writing. Mm. And I, I have a good time. I make a lot of jokes, you know. I, like I'm only writing when I'm writing, you know. And, and, and who I am in the world, you know. I said, yeah, I don't know, you know. You know, it, it's 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 a really it's a it's a very difficult thing. But you know, like I was just given the Grand Master Award a couple of years ago for, from you know the Edgars. I'm the first in 70 years they've been giving it. I'm the first non-white person mm -hmm. ever to get it. Mm -hmm. They could have given it to Chester Himes. Iceberg Slim, mm -hmm. Donald Goins, mm -hmm. Ishmael Reed, mm -hmm. any of those people mm -hmm. deserved it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they didn't do it, you know. And uh, I, I got to say it the night I got the award. I got to thank all of them, you know, for what they had done, you know, to, you know, for, to, you know, push, you know, what I'm doing forward. You know, I think that a lot of people, you know, I, listen, I mean, I don't know what people in here think. I think that Chester Himes is by far superior writer to Ralph Ellison. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, you know, he, he wrote those mysteries. And he also wrote, you know, about homosexual experiences in the 40s, which, you know, was not very popular. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, he's an extraordinary, I mean, sentence by sentence, you just read, even the mysteries, you read him sentence by sentence, you go, my God, how did he even think of writing that sentence? Not like, how long did he have to work at it? How did he think, it's like thinking about Bob Dylan lyrics. You know, where'd, he, where'd he come up with that? You know, it's just amazing. I mean, so part of what you're talking about is, on the one hand, you know, if we're just talking about mystery literature or, or what a crime fiction, there, there's already a necessity to recognize that it's, that it's diverse, that it's mm -hmm. heterogeneous, right? Yeah. And if we turn to African-American literature, it's the same thing. It's not just 
the high literature of Toni Morrison and Ralph Ellison exactly. and all of that, but you have all of these so-called pulp writers that you're, you're referencing too. And um, when you talk to like, like young black men, man, they used to sell you know, the Newberries like you know, five and dime. There, over the ice cream, there would be a, like a row, like this big, of mm -hmm. Donald Goyne's novels. Mm -hmm. And little boys would just be buying those novels. Oh, yeah, listen, what is Iceberg Slimming? Yeah. Let's get Pimp. <laughs> oh, let's get, you know, and it's like, you know, and they're reading those books. It was great that they were reading it. A lot of people got mad at it, you know, so, oh, this is not good. No, but reading is good no matter what you're reading. Right. And uh, I you remind know. myself of that because yeah. my son only reads Avengers stuff. Yeah, you know? exactly. but he's reading. Yeah. He can read exactly. by himself. Um, that's so you, you, but part of part of your, your the way you describe your own literary heritage is you talk about your father, right? Mm -hmm. um, that he's been a major, he was a major influence on you, uh, finding your voice, and, and and you describe him as a master storyteller. Yes, I believe. But one of the other things you say that's really that was really interesting, a little bit shocking to me, was that you don't need to read books to become a writer. I know, that really upsets people so much. Uh, yeah, uh, so I had to I think about that. I had to think about you. I mean, you, 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 you say, okay, well, Homer, for example, oral storyteller, obviously no books back then. And uh, the, the, I think part of the gesture at your father is that, well, he was a writer, you know, but he was, uh, but I'm assuming from the way you describe him that he was also an oral storyteller. Is this mm -hmm. part of what you're talking about? That, you know, storytelling is not just something in books, the high literary tradition, or even just the paper tradition, but something that's passed on or uh, told verbally as well. There's a, there's a few ways to look at it. Number one, lots and lots of people read lots and lots of books and they can't write. Right, that's the first thing. So you, you read the book and you can't write it. You see me. Like if you do exercises, you get muscles. You know what I mean? You know, because that's why you do the exercises, to get muscles and more blood vessels and stuff like that. But a lot of people read and, 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 the, and that doesn't happen. Uh, Homer was blind and illiterate, but he's considered like really the beginning of the Western novel, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, I mean, they, they say they're poems, but really. And, and, and you know, like I'll, I'll be on the radio, I remember I was on the radio station, a guy saying, so uh, in order for our, uh, our listeners to become uh, uh, writers, they have to read a lot, don't they? And they, they would actually nod it at me. And I went, uh, no, no. <laughs> you can actually write a book and not read a book. You know, you know, you, you have to learn what the story is. But a lot of people are like, they, they hang out on street corners. They're telling stories, and they're, they're great. You know, and it starts off with jokes. Mm -hmm. Jokes are the, you know, the, 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 the basis of it, like the basis of plot. Mm -hmm. but, but it just it, it just grows into this much larger thing. Now, reading helps. I mean, you know, yeah, it can help. Um, but. It's, it's not what, you know, reading is one wonderful thing that people do, and writing is another wonderful thing that people do, but they don't necessarily, you know, uh, blend, mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of people, you know, they don't want you to say that because, you know, they want to think they're smart, and, you know, mm -hmm. it's okay. You want to think you're smart, that's fine with me. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm, assuming, I'm assuming there's a whole generation of storytellers who've never read books, but they've seen a lot of movies. Yeah. Right? Oh, or, or they're, they're telling their stories on Instagram and Twitter, yeah. for example. All right. So. And, they, and, they have experience, and they experience the world in a way that they can recreate it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. You're experiencing something, and then you're recreating it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can read a novel, but that's not going to tell you how to do that. That's a whole other experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a lot of questions, and I'm going to end with one question before we turn to uh, the audience. And I'm going to try to connect something in your work. You tell me if it works or not. Mm -hmm. um, there's a moment in the book, uh, Elements of Fiction, I believe, where you say, you don't exist unless you exist in fiction. Yeah. Okay. And I, and I as a writer, of course, as a writer, I believe, of course, that's true. You know, we, we, we validate our own, our own work in this way, uh, especially if we come from populations that we feel have not mm. been adequate. Our stories, have, our stories have always existed, but whether or not these stories are being heard outside of our families and our communities is another issue. Yeah. So, right? so if our books aren't getting published, our movies aren't getting made, our stories aren't getting put out there, it's as if we are invisible, inaudible, non-existent in the society in which we live. Now there's another line that you say, uh, uh, where you say writing fiction is making something from nothing. Yeah. Is that correct? And yeah. then there's also a line where you say, black folks were masters of making something from nothing. Yeah. And so all these things are happening at once in your universe of how you conceive of yourself as a writer. Is it, is it right for me to try to connect all these things that the, the yeah, craft of absolutely. fiction for you is making something out of nothing and this is also 
deeply uh, in intertwined with what it means to be a black person in America and oh, trying to get your story It's very out political, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. I mean, like, I know there are people who are historians, but you know, most people don't read history books except historians. You know, you might watch a documentary or two, but you know, you're not gonna say, I think I'm gonna read about the Napoleonic Wars. You know, and you just sit there with these big books and, you know, and, and one of the problems with people who write books like that, they don't really think that you need to know poetry or anything, so it's really kind of boring. Um, but, but in fiction, if, if, if characters are in fiction, you begin to believe them. I write about uh, people in South Central, and all these people come up to me, and either they say, I was there, and that's what it was like, even if, if what I wrote didn't really happen, or people say, wow, I read your book. You know, those people were thinking just the way I think about things, which you know, is a great revelation to them, because they've only been reading about you know, well, white people. I mean, it's even worse in England, because in England, you know, like for the past 500 years, there's been many, many people of colors. But all of like the, the, the big pageantry movies they do on BBC, there are no people of color whatsoever. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. you, they're actually lying about their own history, you know, whether they know it or not. You know, and so as soon as, as, as you make us a part of, of fiction, of song, you know, of, uh, of art, then we begin to enter into the culture in a way where people can you know, start to believe it. Yeah, and you know, from my perspective as, as a reader, besides being a writer, it was certainly enormously impactful for me to pick up a story or to watch a movie in which it wasn't just all about white people, mm -hmm. but it was also about people of color, whether it was Asian American or Vietnamese or African Americans, I turned for inspiration to those stories as well. So that ends uh, my portion of the conversation with Walter. I want to turn it over to the audience. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for Walter Mosley about his, his art, his books, his life, his rejections, his successes. So I believe uh, Ted has a microphone. Yes, I do. Um, just a quick reminder, questions um, at Live Talks LA typically start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question. And tonight, only Viet gets to ask follow-up questions. <laughs> so with those rules in place, who would like to go first? Stump me with the no two-part <laughs> question, OK. Hi, Walter Mosley. Hi, how are you? Shonda Buchanan. Um, I wanted to ask you, I just came out with my memoir, Black Indian, and I'd like to oh, know... Man. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'd like to know, do you think, and this is a real question, do you think I should focus on the PR and publicity right now because you're such a master at that with all of your work, or do you think I should start editing my novel, which is finished, and then... So that's like a real question for me. And I took your advice when I saw you years ago um, in uh, Newport News, and you said every first writer should invest in a good PR company or person because you, you have one shot. So that's, that's a real question for me. Um, well, I, I think it, it, it's true that, that the best way you can to get your book out there, whether it's you know, uh, you know, finding a, a publicist that's, you know, uh, that one can afford, or, uh, or working you know, like in social media you know, and, and, and trying to you know, go in, in that direction, I think uh, that's really important. But if there's any editing left to do on the book, I think the editing on the book is the most important thing. So you know, it's like the, the best book is, is the most important thing that you'll ever do for yourself. So there's that. But yes, you, uh, to work on it as best you can. Hi, um, one question, well, one statement. My mother's friend, a family of our family, they taped um, Devil in the Blue Dress at her house. And I couldn't wait till the movie was over to walk where <laughs> Easy sat. I, it was just an experience I will never forget. And second, I worked at Channel 4 News for 30 years, and I want to write a tell-all book. And I know all the ghosts in the closet, but can I mention names, or do I have to use fake names <laughs> for the real people who did the dirty things in the newsroom? Guys, it's, I mean, you really, honestly, whatever you say about people in the world uh, is, is um, you know, I mean, people won't like to sue. Uh, but, and, and um, you know, I have an op-ed piece coming out uh, this weekend, which, uh, in the uh, the uh, Sunday New York Times, which you know, I'd be very careful about who I didn't didn't name, but um, so I, but you know, it depends if if it's if it's truly as libel what you're saying, 
if something is true and it really happened and, and, and it's provable, it's not liable, it's fine. You know, you should still ask a lawyer, but it's fine. <laughs> um, but you know, if, if, if it can be construed as liable, then you have to worry about it. Yeah. Could you speak a little about your experience working with John Singleton uh, this past season? Yeah, sure, uh, John. I mean, you know, the the thing I you, you have, I mean, it's so so hard in Hollywood because people people are naturally competitive in Hollywood, like, and they can't even help it. They don't even know they are. But you know, John was a genius. Not many people say that, but John was a genius. John did things that other people couldn't do. Boys in the Hood is is such an extraordinary film, and it's so important. And nobody else could make it then, and nobody else can make it now. You know, and John was also an extremely wonderful person. He got hundreds of people jobs. I mean, literally hundreds, not just you know ten or twenty. He, he would meet people. There's a there was a, a woman who was like on this. Yeah, when he was like in, in our documentary about about the uh, the crew for for uh, Snowfall. You know, and they said, well, how'd you get this job? I said, well, I, uh, I got out of prison, and the next day I saw John. I said, I'm looking for a job. And John said, well, come on down, you can work for us. You know, and, and you're part of the crew. You know, and, and he just, you know, me. He said, said Walter, I'm, I'm working on Snowfall. Come, come, come work with us. I said, John, I don't know anything about television. He said, Well, that's okay. You figure it out, man, because because you were there, right? Because we want to talk about that, and you know, and that's that's the only reason I'm writing for television. I can still pay my rent. You know, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, he was, he's just a, you know, it was a, a, a wonderful, quirky, nerdy, funny, um, you know, guy who was completely committed. To South Central, he was born there. He worked there. He, he 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 didn't die there, but he got buried there. You know, I mean, it was just it. Everything was was uh, was was about his people, his life, his stories, and he was committed to it. Hi, um, my name's Cleo, and I'm a young writer. I'm only 24, and I'm desperately wondering how you force yourself to stop editing your book and just let it be finished. <laughs> Oh, well, that's very simple. I, I like that. Uh, it, f writing a book, you write, write the book, and then you read it, and there's, there's mistakes, and you fix them, and then you read it, and there's mistakes, and you fix them. And you do that again and again. Maybe you do it 20 times. Then at one point, you read the book, and there are mistakes, and you can't fix them. So that's when your book is finished. <laughs> it's never going to be perfect. So like, you know, like if you have that thing, you know. It's just not gonna, you know, it's not gonna happen. Okay, first I'd like to say thank you for making a reader out of me when I hated it so much for so <laughs> long. And then, before you were forced to write your novel, did you know that you were a storyteller? And if you did, when did you discover that? It's a, it's a good question. I, I always thought that I was good, you know, with bullshit, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and that I could, you know, I could, you know, if, if you didn't ask me true and false and you asked, just asked me to explain something, I could kind of explain it, you know. Uh, so, you know, I could do better than, you know, um, you know, having some kind of like, you know, specific answers. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, just, I just started writing. It was funny. I was, I was like 34. And I wrote a sentence on hot, sticky days in southern Louisiana, the fire ants swarmed. I thought, said, hey. You know, that sounds like a novel. <laughs> I've read novels that sound like that. And it must be fiction, because I've never been to Louisiana. I've never seen a fire ant, so I'm making it up. Uh, so let's see where that goes, you know? And, you know, and, I, and I think, you know, uh, I, I've, I've listened to lots of poets. Uh, uh, but one of the 10 greatest poets in the history of America is a guy named Etheridge Knight. Etheridge, is, he was really, I mean, Everything was wrong with Esther. He was a heroin addict. He was in prison forever. He was like, you know, I mean, he treated women so badly. But his poems, and, 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 and um, I had listened to a whole bunch of poets explain how hard uh, they were, you know, they were homeless, they were uh, beaten, they were, you know, all these things happened to them. And Etheridge, who had a much harder life than all these other poets, came up and he said, look, he said, when I became a poet, I was in the penitentiary. And when I was in the penitentiary, I defined myself as a poet. And he said, and once I defined myself as a poet, I went to the library to figure out what it was I had become. <laughs> <laughs> and in my opinion, this is one of the 10 greatest poets in America, right? Like American history. 
Uh, and, you know, he's there with Whitman. And, and like, you know, you just do it, right? You know, you have to work, like all these other rules and stuff that they got in school. Did you get an A? Did you do this? Did you, you know, what's your penmanship? Like, fuck that stuff, you know? You just do it, you know? And either it works or it doesn't work, right? You know? Hi. Thank you for the nod. I'm a poet, so thank you for that head nod. I appreciate it. Um, years and years and years ago, there was um, a little whisper about you creating a series for Easy Rollins. Yeah. And I was just wondering if that was ever going to come to fruition. Uh, I have no idea. I've, I've, I've tried it like six or seven times, and every time they come up and they say, well, could we make a contemporary? Uh, <laughs> You know, could we, you know, does he have to be, you know, it really goes on and on. And, you know, it's always, that, you know, it always ends up they don't make it. Uh, maybe. You know, might make it one day. I keep trying, you know. So, maybe. Uh, actually, in one of your interviews, you said, this is around the time of Black Panther. You said, oh, there, we have about a nine-month window now with oh, Black yeah. Panther. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's over now, though. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, it didn't happen, yeah, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, my movie agent is somewhere here. We're trying to do, uh, trying to redo um, uh, Devil in a Blue Dress is a film. I think I'd, I'd like to see it as a film again. It's, it's been like, you know, almost, you know al almost 30 years. I think there's like six Spider-Mans. Yeah. So why not have a second Devil in a Blue Dress? Yeah. So, let's do it again, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, that's right. I think there's other points. Uh, Walter, Mr. Moldy, sorry. Yeah? When writing a, say, a, Walter? <laughs> when writing a, a, a mystery novel, yeah. do you ever find that you kind of get lost in, in how to bring everything back together. Because oftentimes, when, when I write, I don't know what's going to happen at the end. Mm -hmm. So it becomes difficult to tie all the different events back into one to make it all kind of make sense to everyone else as, instead of the small, little different stories in the middle. And so, so it's such a wonderful question. And, and, and it is partially because it's, I've just been thinking about it a lot lately. I just got to the end of this Easy Rollins novel, uh, Blood Grove. And about, about two weeks ago, I got to the end, and I, and, I, I, and I was reading through it again, and I went, wow, you know, the, the mystery actually doesn't work. It, it, it's not working. Like, if this guy does that here, how come they don't know about it here? And if this happens there, and it was a whole bunch of things. And, it, and actually, it, 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 I'm not going to write this book, but I did think this would be like a, also a good book to write about writing, because... I had to write a second outline. I had to go back through the book and outline what, sh what does happen and what should happen. And I even titled it The Second Outline. And I was like, wow, The Second Outline. That sounds so existentialist or something. You know? It's like so cool. You know? So I think that, yes, you come to the end, and it doesn't work. And then you figure out uh, what doesn't work and why and how. And then you fix it. You know? Hello, Walter. Yep. Manuel Tucker. I grew up in the area around the Dunbar Hotel during the early 60s. I'm trying to put together stories about my experiences here, and I'm all over the place. Is it just important for me to just keep writing them and try to organize them afterward? Uh-huh. Or yes. what's your advice? Absolutely. <laughs> keep writing them. Thank just you. keep writing them. And uh, by the by, there's a woman over there who keeps having her hand up. But yeah, um, yeah, uh, keep keep writing. You know, uh, just and, and what I tell people is this: I don't know how long you've been been writing it. Okay, what what I what I do to when I talk to people about writing, like I talk to Paul Coates, who has an incredible experience. You know, I mean, he's Tanahasi's father, but also he was the head of the Panthers uh, in Baltimore in the '60s. Uh, you know, they, they blamed him for all kinds of stuff. The FBI was stalking him. Uh, people in the Panthers were trying to kill him. Um, and, uh, and he didn't, he, he wanted to write it, but he thought he couldn't. He's a publisher. I don't need him to get that, but I said, look, Paul, just every day write for like one to two hours for a hundred days on that story. Every day, one to two hours on the same story. Write for a hundred days, then go back and look at what you've written, and that'll tell you where you're going to go. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. Mr. Mosley, um, Kathy Jones, Courtney Bird is back here, too. The two of us worked on Devil in a Blue Dress. Oh, how wonderful. Yes, and that's what I wonder what it was like for you as a writer, because on the crew, it was an amazing experience. And everyone has their horror stories about what production is like, but that 
particular production was wonderful for us. What was it like for you? Well, you know, it was, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I didn't spend that much time. I was, you know, living in New York. And, um, and so I, I wasn't allowed on the set. But I remember the day I got on the set was the first day that Don Cheadle was on the set dressed up as Mouse. And I just saw him and went, oh my god, it's Mouse. You know, I didn't know Don or anything then. You know, and I was like, wow. It was just, it was so beautiful. And everybody was, they were, you know, like Carl Franklin's such a great director, and he, and he wrote that script. Um, and, and everybody, you know, all of these, you know, you see all these black actors there, and you see the, that, that, the rebuilding of, of, of South Central. You know, and you, and, you know, listen, when you make a set, you don't, you don't make it look exactly like it looks because it would get, get kind of vacuous. But you, you, you kind of condense everything. So you really, really experience you know, the way people experienced it. And it was just so beautiful. Everything was beautiful. The acting was great. You know, um, you know I, 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 got lot, I came out with a lot of good friends from, you know, from that. And you know, that was, it was really wonderful. Yeah. And our last question for the evening. Hello, I'm Phyllis Chastain. Thank you for this presentation. I've written over 80 ebooks during the course of my PhD program and published them. But my question is, how do you protect the privacy of your work as you go through the writing process in this age of high tech with things on servers, et cetera? That's my question. Huh. You know, I haven't had much problem with that. You know, it's, 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 you know, I mean, I'm, I suppose there are people who, like, you know, uh, in some ways, you know, might, might take a, 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 a digital uh, file and move it somewhere and then somebody else will read it, you know. But, you know, on the whole, you know, the, I mean, I'm, I'm selling, you know, books at, you know, at a rate that kind of makes sense for me in my career at this point in time. <laughs> and so I, I haven't really, you know, I haven't really, you know, worried about it. Uh, and, you know, if you're doing it yourself, uh, it's really hard to do. Because how do you protect it? If, you know, it, it's like mostly I have publishers who do it, and they, you know, and they have their, you know, they, they keep watching things and looking things. But, you know, look, uh, you know, I, <laughs> somebody came up to me once and said, well, you know, I, I just read your book uh, in Vietnamese. And I went, Not really? Really? The Vietnamese government won't, won't publish my books in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. And... And, and that's because probably they have to buy it from you. No, they, no, didn't... no, they bought it from me. The, 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 they, this won't they bought it? it? I'm censored in Vietnam, dude. So, oh, oh yeah. because you're censored, yeah. right? OK. okay. Uh, that, that's why. Because like, <laughs> I never sold it to them. But somebody in oh, Vietnam is probably pirated. It. Yeah, that's, even, that's a great and, honor. And, and in India <laughs> and, in, and in China, you know, like there are places where people just publish my books. And, and I go, okay, you know, I mean, it's really, I, what am I going to do, right? You know, I mean, it's like I'm going to go to Vietnam and say, Who, who's the publisher, you know? And, uh, you know, I mean, I guess they'll say, well, that's too bad, you know, or maybe they'll kill me, I don't know. Um, <laughs> they'll say, he's, he's going to cause trouble. But, but I don't really have an answer to that. That's, a, that's actually a more technical uh, uh, question that, you know, that I'm not, you know. Now, the, the, you, you behind, behind the woman who just asked the question, did you have a question? Or, or did, am I just making that up? Um, I did. OK. I didn't know if it was a very good question, because I'm not a creative person. OK. Um, I'm a consumer good. of creativity, um, of other people's creativity. And you were talking about the poet that you said was a heroin addict and, and this, that, and the other. And my mind um, went to the philosophical question of how do you separate the art from the artist? Huh. Well, you know, I, I, I think of all these people, you know, people who always made fun of me about this in the old days, who I was afraid of, you know. People who I love. Amiri Baraka. I mean, you can't get, you can't get more brilliant than Amiri Baraka. Amiri mean, Baraka once said, he said, um, he said, you know, I used to go down to the corner and listen to jazz. Now I got to go to another man's neighborhood and pay him to find out what I got on my own mind. I'm like saying, oh my God. And he was just talking. He wasn't like writing, it wasn't a poem. He was just talking. You know? I, look, I stayed away from Amiri because, you know, he was, you know, he was violent, you know, and angry and competitive and all kinds of stuff. And I don't know why, because, you know, I thought it was great, but, you know, it wasn't good enough. And, you know, Etheridge also, you know, you don't, you don't want to mess around with Etheridge because you could, you could end up in prison, you know. He wouldn't be there, but you could end up there, you know. 
but I mean, the, the work was, you know, fantastic, you know? And, and who, uh, you know, I, I think is, if a person is authentic in their own life and in their own neighborhood and their own skin, even if I don't like what that is, I can still read their books. I can still appreciate their work. You know, Picasso was an ass, man. But, but his painting is outrageously good. You know, but I mean, you know, he, he treated people really bad, especially women. But he treated everybody really bad. And he stole like hand, you know, hand over fist. He's just like, I'll take all your work. When people, he, he used to come to people's, uh, you know, uh, studios, and they would hide everything, you know, under sheets. Because if he even just looked out of the corner of his eye and saw your stuff, he would do twice as good that night, you know, and, and you'd be lost, you know. Um, but you know, he was Picasso, so I still like him anyway. You know, I don't, you know. I'd even like it if he stole something from me. That'd be nice. Well, with that, gentlemen, thank you, Viet. Great to have you back on our stage, Walter. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. That was really that was great. Awesome. That was really fun. Thank you.